Today we have a crazy malicious compliance story about somebody trying to be a good Samaritan, but it turning into so much more. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, you know how it's done? Right then. So about 15 or so years ago, I was working in a little metalworking firm. Two brothers owned, 30 or so workers, metal casting, further processing up to including wires and other things. We had about five women working in production, me, my mom, and three others. One of them was the unofficial sweetheart of one of our bosses. Karen, changing name for privacy, couldn't do wrong. Whatever went wrong wasn't her fault, ever. I had a run-in with her a few times already, and it wasn't the best, but I'm more of the silent type. Let others do what they want, I'll do my thing, etc. Us women were mostly there for preparing the product for sending out. Washing metal bits, grinding back seams, sorting small things into good and broken or not fully cast, etc. I've been working there summers in the 90s, with my gran as unofficial supervisor, and she showed me the ropes. Later when I worked there full time, I knew the ins and outs of things, and some tricks gran worked out along the way, especially with our washing machines. Imagine them as a big bowl, filled with specially formed stones, add water and cleaning agent, the metal bits, and it would vibrate and the stones rubbing against the product with soap and water would clean the product from residual oil and other things. One of the machines required a more special touch, apart from throw in, start, done. I've been working there long enough and had been shown by Gran and Mom how to set up that machine. It polished the metal on top of cleaning it with tiny spherical metal bits. Never cared enough to ask what they were made of, it was enough to know how to use it to make things shine. So one day I get a call, boss asking if I was washing something at the moment and what I was working on. I told them no, done with washing, I was just now drilling the last holes and preparing the product for shipping out. He said he'd send Karen down with something time sensitive and that was that. Karen comes down an hour later, crate with time sensitive products has been there for a while, and it's coated with oil, soot and all things nasty, ready to be cleaned and polished in that special machine. I ask if she needs some help or some pointers, since I know that machine is a bit complicated to set up right. She looks at me dirty and sweaty as I was actually from working, and she was nearly pristine from doing whatever she did with the boss, don't care, keep me out of it, and sniffs. Tells me she knows how to wash them and disappears in the washroom. Well then, if you know. A colleague comes over and asks if she ever used that machine, and I shrug and tell him not that I know of. She wasn't very popular there. Can you tell? I go back to work, time goes by, lunch, more time, and then our boss shows up. Product needs to be sent out today. Not long after, there's a shout for me to come to the washroom. Turns out Karen doesn't know how to use the machine. The whole thing is oily, black, and nasty. Product looks worse than before. She used the wrong cleaning agent, didn't add the polishing powder at the right time, and pretty much screwed the whole thing up. Boss asked me why I didn't say something, help her, intervened, anything. Well, she said she knew what to do. Ask colleague, he was there. Door to the washroom is closed, and I have other things to do than stick my nose where it's not wanted. Do I know how to deal with this problem? Sure, machine and stones need cleaning, product needs cleaning, it's gonna take a while. In the end, Karen was allowed to finish my dirty work, and I spent the rest of the day cleaning up her mess. I wasn't allowed to leave the washroom, boss's orders, so I started a washing cycle with the right agent and no product in to clean the machine and stones, sat down and did nothing, then added the product, more cleaning agent and powder after the oily gunk was gone, and pretty much spent half a day doing close to nothing while Karen had to do my work. I could have helped her, but us unwashed peasants were not good enough for her highness. Just as clean and as wrinkle-free as her clothes were, her brain was the exact same way. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, complain to me pretending to be a patient's father? Well, let's involve her parents then. I used to work at a very nice private hospital where the place looked like a hotel. The food was great and the service unrivaled. We were voted best private hospital in the country quite a few times, and all around, people were happy and the care was great. The nurses were mostly old school, stern but very passionate about patient care with no time for anything that stops them from doing their job. My job was to focus on marketing and complaints, and to be honest, 
I didn't have a lot of work on the complaint side, but every now and again something would come up. If there was an incident, the RNs would usually come and warn me to expect something and give their side of the story. One morning as I got to work, an RN was waiting at my door to update me on an incident the previous night. There was an 18 year old patient who had a small op, but was prone to dizziness and fainting. Now, slip and falls are a big thing in hospitals and these incidents get monitored very closely. Since she was a slip and fall risk, they moved her to a private room right in front of the nurse's station so that she can be monitored throughout the night and day. One night, the tattoo clad, older nurse's description, 20 something boyfriend comes to visit and forgets that this is in fact a hospital and not a hotel. Old school stern nurse realized something is amiss when the room's doors were closed and after she pushed the door open, the curtains around the bed was drawn too. Seeing the privacy take second priority to a patient's healing and safety in a hospital, old school nurse wasn't having any of this. She pulls the curtains open, pulls the boyfriend out of the hospital bed and gave them both a talking to. Tattoo boyfriend left soon afterwards, apparently furious that his evening was ruined. Sure enough, two hours after the nurse visited my office, I get a mail from the patient's father, detailing how his daughter's privacy was invaded the previous night, how she had a private conversation with her boyfriend, and how they were unfairly treated by a nurse. I was surprised that an older gentleman would write an email to a hospital with so many spelling errors and complete lack of punctuation, but the email address, something like tattoo guy at gmail was a total giveaway as to who the real author was. Now technically I was just able to reply on the email, detailing our experience inside of the story. However, sharing private patient information on an email to an unconfirmed email address is bound to get me in serious trouble. So I did what any sane and perhaps slightly malicious person would do. I called document control and asked them to pull the email address on file for me. This happened to belong to her mom. I forwarded the email to her, mentioning that I received the following email from her daughter's father, but since she's the contact person on file and we need to stick with the people that we have permission to contact, may she be as kind to as share our response with him? I then detailed what the nurse told me about the patient being a slip and fall risk that requires constant monitoring, about the boyfriend visiting, about the door and curtain being closed, and the nurse catching them in the hospital bed together. I apologized on behalf of the nurse for invading their privacy, but explained that open doors are protocol to ensure a patient's safety, and our main priority is getting a patient safe, healthy, and back at home as soon as possible. I ended the mail with my contact details and invited her to contact me if she has any further questions. Well, if the parents didn't know about the incident, they knew now. I'm told the daughter was well behaved for the remainder of their time, and the boyfriend didn't stop by once during the rest of the patient's stay. So lessons learnt, don't include your parents' details on your hospital file as your main contact details if you don't want them contacted. Don't try and catfish a hospital employee, and respect a hospital for what it is. A place of healing and not a hotel. Honestly kind of impressive that they were willing to risk it and go for it right there in the hospital. I can only imagine how they were feeling in that oh crap moment when they hear the door open up. Our next story is, don't even think to talk to you? Sure. This morning, I went out for a nice breakfast and coffee at a cafe located in a square with my female friend. I sat outside to enjoy the most of such a beautiful day. Halfway through, I went to a toilet and there was a queue. I was pushed by someone behind, and as a result I bumped into the girl in front of me. She turned around and gave me an angry look. I quickly told her I was sorry and someone pushed me from behind. People behind me quickly denied it and it seemed to become very weird, so I moved back to avoid conflict. A couple standing nearby told her about the incident, but she insisted it was me trying to hit on her as the group again denied and told the couple to mind their own business. When she walked back out, she threw me a disgusted look. I didn't want to make a scene, so I just ignored her. When I came back to my table, I told my friend about the incident. The girl stood up to go inside for something. My friend and I caught a very noticeable red stain in the bottom of her white pants, spread all the way up to the half of the bottom area. We gave each other a look of guessing if it was a period blood. 
I felt bad for her, so trying to be a better person, asking my friend to warn her as we're in a very crowded area. My friend walked over with a piece of paper, trying to slip the message to her, but she quickly moved back, didn't even wait for my friend to say anything, and started raising her voice, calling us creeps and trying to take advantage of a beautiful young girl, her exact words, and so on. She ended everything with, Oh heck no, no no no. You stay away from me, you and your disgusting friend. I don't want to hear anything from you. Don't ever talk to me, you pieces of crap. Go away or I'll call the police. My friend was shocked, but simply complied and returned to our table. The guy of the couple in the toilet incident was sitting near us and told us that he let her embarrass herself. She went straight inside to find the manager, trying to get us kicked out. The manager came outside to talk to us. We all, including the couple, gave our side of the event and demanded to check CCTV footage. We all walked back in, and bam, there it was, me being pushed, me minding my own business the whole time. And there she was, walking in and out several times with her period all over her pants. My friend showed them the note. She was embarrassed and tried to twist the guilt to us and excuse how it's normal for her to act that way. Not even a sorry or anything. After we cleared our name, the manager apologized. We left right after that. On the way out, we all laughed as we saw the girl trying to walk and cover her butt with her purse. In this situation, instead of complying and just leaving, should they have just blurted out loud, like maybe extra loud? I was just trying to help you in your situation and, you know, then explain what was going on. Or was it the right thing to just leave, let her have her assumptions and let her find out later on on her own? Our next story is the angry Christians. So I just remembered this after talking about high school with a friend and it jogged my memory. So I went to a Christian high school. Of course, they accepted people of every faith. They weren't that kind of Christian school you sometimes hear about. Well, one day when I was in year 9, maybe 10, I'm in the UK by the way, so ages 13 to 15, we got invited to go on a Christian retreat, which is basically a bunch of students who signed up for it going to a building like a big sleepover, going hiking obviously, talking about religion and generally having a good time. Now something to note, I was and quite frankly still am an emo, so I was listening to a lot of different bands and singers that wouldn't be considered Christian. Anyway, me and about 15 other students signed up for this retreat. Most of us weren't religious, but it was a good time to get away from things. It was only a couple hours away from our school, but the mountains and greenery made it so peaceful. Well, on the first day there, we got asked to come into the hall, introduce ourselves, and talk about what was going on. Then they decided to have a little fun. I want us to go around and talk about our t-shirts and share why we wore them, said one of the Christian ladies. No one put their hand up to volunteer, so she started picking on people. She picked on one guy who had a generic t-shirt on and he was reluctant to say anything. Come on now, talk about why you wore your t-shirt and what it means to you. You've got to do it, it's a fun little icebreaker. The boy awkwardly said that he wore it because he liked the band and the color and that was that. Then she saw my friendly face, not kidding, even though I was an emo I was super smiley. She said, oh you, would you like to tell us all what's on your t-shirt and why you wore it? Come on, show us all how it's done. Oh, well, she did ask for it. Uh, I'm wearing a band t-shirt because I like listening to their music. And what does that writing say? Um, going to hell? Silence. Well, needless to say, we did not continue playing that icebreaker game. And from then on, they didn't really like me. Still had some fun, though. Not gonna lie, growing up, I actually did go on some kind of similar-ish retreat type thing. And although I personally don't believe myself to be practicing any kind of religion nowadays, I actually did find it to be a rather fun time. I mean, there were still other kids to hang around with, they were all good people. And there was also plenty of time given to go around and play things like volleyball, basketball, and they even had a lake. We got to go around on paddle boats which was pretty neat until we found out that there were alligators in the water and everybody was scared away. My boss punished me by reducing my hours but didn't tell the other boss. This happened quite a while ago. I was working remotely for a staffing agency, organizing and managing events. When I was initially hired on, it was due to the fact that three employees were quitting. 
They all seemed to be leaving amicably to pursue other ventures, so I didn't think anything of it. They had hired myself and one other person to replace them, and everything was going fine. Over time, I started to notice little things here and there, like issues due to miscommunication between the owners, married couple, and a heavy workload. A few months in, I was assaulted and had been injured pretty badly. It was really difficult, obviously, but I worked remotely, so I was still able to work. I told my bosses I had an emergency and was injured and needed to take some time off. Almost immediately, one of the owners called and left an angry-sounding voicemail. I called them back and ended up having to tell them that I'd been assaulted and went to the hospital and all that. He seemed sympathetic, but near the end of the conversation, he noted that I was supposed to be managing an event that weekend, Friday to Sunday, and that they had no one else to manage it. He didn't do any of that, but his wife did. However, we always had at least five events we were organizing and managing at a time. I was afraid I would get fired, so I ended up having to work that weekend. It wasn't so bad, but I was in an incredible amount of pain, and due to my injuries, the doctor said they couldn't prescribe me any strong pain medication due to complications that may arise. I worked that weekend and pushed through. Shortly after that, they fired another employee and gave me her workload. Then, they chose me to do a very long-running, two-plus months, event taking place in two different time zones. They initially decided the event would be split between myself and another employee. She was pregnant, it matters for context, due to the size of the program. So while I was dealing with the assault and healing, took a month for my injuries to heal, I was also doing the majority of the workload of this event. I was also having to plan a move, put my stuff in a storage unit, and living in a long-term sublet while I looked for a place. I was also organizing other events on top of that. So, there were days where I would easily work 10 plus hours. Eventually, the employee who was helping me went on maternity leave. So, the whole program landed on my shoulders. One day, I got reprimanded for working overtime. I explained that the workload was heavy and since I was managing events in two time zones, I was having to wake up super early in the morning, 4am, work during the day, take a long lunch, work some more, then wrap up the other event which ended in the evening, 10.30 to 11 p.m. They basically told me I needed to manage my time better. Well, I wasn't doing well mentally or physically, so my cognitive abilities weren't the best. I was making small, easily fixable mistakes here and there, but nothing that was damaging or severely detrimental to the business. There were days I would just sit there crying at my desk. It was awful. Another employee had also been reprimanded for working overtime, and she was as swamped as I was. Eventually, one of my bosses emailed me and said I was still working too much overtime, and that he only wanted me to work 5 hours on days where I wasn't managing the big event. I was relieved, honestly. I was looking forward to having more time for myself so I could heal. I made sure to email him back to confirm the non-show management days he wanted me to work 5 hours for the following week. Well, he didn't tell his wife, the other owner, about my new hours. And she had a tendency to ramble about stuff during meetings, making them last way longer than they needed to be. One day, we had a meeting in the morning that lasted three hours, and it was the first day I was to only work five hours. I didn't even need to be in that meeting, but they forced me to stay and would get irritated if they knew myself or other employees were quietly working while listening to the meeting. After that meeting, the wife sends me messages asking about the progress of some things I was working on. She then added some more things for me to do. The back and forth with her only took about 20 minutes. I told her that I knew I wouldn't have enough time to finish those things that day because I only had a little over an hour and a half to complete the other tasks I would already been assigned. She had no idea what I was talking about, so I told her that her husband had reduced my hours on non-management days and forwarded her our email exchanges where he confirmed I was to only work 5 hours that day. She got an attitude with me and said, well, these are higher priority things and we need you to work on them. You can go ahead and work longer today. I told her I couldn't because I had a confirmed week prior and had made arrangements and wasn't able to work. So once I hit my 5 hours, I clocked out and put my phone on do not disturb, ignoring all the messages she was sending me. She ended up having to work on all the tasks she had given me 
late into the night. I continued to follow the new schedule and they just dumped my workload onto other employees or had to do it themselves. I eventually got fired because they said that was basically the last straw, but I was so relieved and also got unemployment benefits even though they tried to fight it. The real warning highlight here is them firing three people and hiring two to replace them. That immediately should have showed you exactly what was going on here. Our next story is, guy wants to fight me, I guess. This was a long time ago, pre-internet in fact. I, 17 year old male, was working a dishwashing job in the 80s. A newish dishwasher challenged me to a fight. I didn't want to fight, I really liked my job. The pay was $3.40 an hour. I was also fed a big meal at work. This was a ballroom kind of place that did weddings, dinners, and Sunday brunch. And I know it sounds oxymoronic, but dare I say high-end buffet? I loved it. Food at home was locked up in a closet and I never got enough to eat, so work was heaven. Back in the day pre-internet, there were lots of fights if you were a male. In my experience, you could get into a fight even if you were avoiding conflict. It just happened a bunch, or I was just lucky. Maybe it was because I was dressed out of fashion and my stepmother would take all my money and get me those plastic blue jeans called tough skins. They would melt if you lit them on fire. Don't ask how I know. You would wear out your knee before you wore a hole in them. I had the dorkiest glasses too. I was branded an outcast. Get off the bus and 15 people get off at your stop. A circle forms and you have to fight someone. I lost all my fights. It sucked. I cried. Just a part of life. If I had magic powers, I would make bullying go away. But back in the day, no one cared. It wasn't physical build that cost me the fights. I think it was confidence and my conflict avoidance. At home, I was the older brother. So in all those home fights, I tried to fight at 80% because I didn't want to hurt my kid brother while he would try to clobber me. I had too much empathy. Also at home, my stepmother had this 110 foot long cliff that was 10 feet tall in the backyard that had a septic field behind it that no truck could drive on. Thus I spent my days with a shovel and a wheelbarrow moving dirt even in the rain to turn this cliff into a gentle slope for my stepmother's epic dream flower bed. I had the arms and upper body strength despite not being on a sports team. That comes into the story. I told the new dishwasher I didn't want to fight. He therefore called me names and said I was afraid and so on. I ignored him. This continued for a month. It was the theme of busy Friday nights and also Sunday mornings. He wanted to talk about how I was afraid to fight him and how I was so weak and so on. He called me those classic 1980s derogatory terms that are now out of vogue. This eventually got old, so one Sunday morning when he challenged me yet again, I said, let's fight then. He was surprised I said yes to a fight. We went outside to the parking lot and it had just rained. He asked again if I wanted to fight. I said I really did. I've heard all about how I can't fight and I'm afraid for like a month. So now I want to fight and end it already. He said he was just joking and he didn't really want to fight. I told him he wanted a fight and I was going to give him exactly what he wanted and had waited so long for. Now I didn't really want to hurt him. I saw him as sort of like my little brother. Annoying, sure, but not someone I want to injure. We work together after all and it is at a place I like to work and yet I did want to let him know not to try this crap again. He looked truly frightened. I grabbed his squishy body and put him on a wet car hood and dried the car off from the rain. I used him like a chamois or one of those big car wash sponges. These were not nice cars. They were owned by dishwashers and cooks, making 3 to $7 an hour. Even so, I don't think I scraped any of them, or if I did, you couldn't tell. I buffed each car with this dishwasher one after another. He was wiggly, but the friction was low, so honestly it wasn't all that much of a workout. He yelped a bit and seemed genuinely afraid. In the end, he was absolutely soaked. I was too, if only by proximity. He did me the favor of telling everyone about what had happened, and the general consensus was that it was funny, so I didn't face work consequences. After that, I got to wash dishes in peace. This is going against the classic, why don't you pick on someone your own size? 
you're literally picking on somebody that is actually bigger than you. You're hoping they have a mentality of a puppy inside the body of a pit bull. You're gonna bank on that for an entire month-long period of bullying? Our next story is, malicious compliance by all the students caused the whole school to reek. This is an old story I'd forgotten about until just now. Ah, the nostalgia. It happened when I was in middle school, about 2010. A bit of context, I live in an old rural town, not in the US. The only middle school in this town used to be a nursery, the kind where plants and trees are grown or sold, not a medical nursery. Most of the trees weren't cut down when the place became a school and a few of them were fruit trees. Three or four of them were mango trees. Us kids loved taking them home by the bunches to enjoy with our families or eating them during lunch and breaks. Occasionally some kids would try throwing rocks or sticks at the tree branches to make some mangoes fall. One of the teachers didn't like this. Understandably, throwing rocks could be dangerous, but nobody was throwing them at each other, and they were careful looking around for any people passing by so as to not hurt anyone. The most logical thing to do would have been to forbid students from throwing things at trees, but instead, the school passed a rule that any students caught picking up mangoes, whether they be on the floor or trying to get them from the trees, would get in trouble or even face suspension. We all thought it was a dumb idea, but me and a few other students could smell the eventual disaster from a mile away. So nobody protested, and everyone at school agreed to comply, even the kids who were known to be rebellious. Well, about a month or so later, the whole school was absolutely stinking of rotten mangoes. And for those of you who don't know, mango season usually peaks during early spring and late summer, plus in the state we're in rainy season hits in summer. So imagine old rotting mangoes and muddy water puddles that sit for days at a time in the summer heat. Not a good combination of smells. The teachers by that point told us that if we see a mango in good condition to be eaten, we could pick them up. But we couldn't possibly break the new rule that was imposed by our respectable teacher. We must obey like the good students we are. The school had to pay a cleanup crew to dump all the rubbish and some of the parents, my mom included, complained about the wastefulness of perfectly edible fruit. The next school year, we were all enjoying delicious manganadas, which is mango flavored ice pop with a spicy sweet sauce. Under the lovely shade and those good old summer breezes, said ice pops were made and sold by classmates. The teacher that had originally started the complaints was a loyal customer. I guess there were no janitors at this school, huh? Because I would assume it's not that big of a stretch for them to go and just pick up the mangoes every now and then. This next story is, we have to use a weed killer on our lawn? Fine. We've lived in this neighborhood for 15 years now, and the HOA board, like many, is mostly made up of the grouchy old people who have too much time on their hands. Sometimes it's fine for a while, and then someone new takes over and has some vendetta to pursue. I guess we were due for the pendulum to swing. Our front yard has a few big trees and is thus entirely in the shade. We've tried to plant grass seed a few times, but there's just not enough sun for grass to thrive. So it's mostly low ground cover. No idea what kind, but it's green and we keep it mowed. For 13 years, this was fine. Then last year, we got a nasty gram from the HOA. We had weeds! According to the bylaws, we needed to prove we were using chemical lawn treatments to kill anything that's not grass. Crucially, the rules don't require us to hire a weed control company, although that's what they expected. We just had to provide proof in the form of a receipt for money spent. My lovely, petty spouse went on Amazon and ordered a $6 spray bottle of the most woo-woo, new-age, homeopathic weed killer she could find. I think the main ingredient was lavender oil. We dutifully spritzed the yard a few times, sent an action shot and a copy of the digital receipt, and thanked them for their concern. The lavender oil shockingly did nothing. We didn't actually have to kill the weeds though, just try. We've heard nothing from the HOA since, and the front yard still has almost no grass. I mean, I get an HOA not wanting you to have weeds in your yard. But man, it's still kind of crazy to me that they just expect everybody to spray chemicals all over their individual yards. Like, do they not even have a clause for, like, proving that you pulled the weeds? Like, you have to prove that you sprayed some kind of chemical? 
But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.